grace and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you for worshiping with us. We're privileged to offer this time of worship through the ministry of the First Baptist Church of Bryson City, North Carolina. We lift up the Almighty God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus, and we trust that by His Spirit we'll meet Him in praise and worship during these moments. I encourage you to join in with whatever responses you find helpful. Sing, pray, stand, kneel, raise your hands, take notes, confess sin, and surrender to God. Be at liberty in the Spirit. Together may we see God more clearly, savor Him more fully, and share Him more freely. Amen. Grace and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. We're here at First Baptist Church in Bryson City. Thank you for joining us wherever you are from the live stream. We've got a good crew of worship leaders and folks here to worship this morning. We've had to be real conscious the past few weeks to uh, keep every other pew marked off and a lot of folks wearing, wearing their masks here and it's keeping our distance. And uh, we're, we're really looking towards August 9th, hoping to be able to to gather back for worship and, and regather on August 9th. Of course, that will all be uh, contingent and dependent upon our community health and the guidelines and what's going on here in a few weeks. We're just taking things day by day right now. But uh, hopefully sooner than later we'll be able to, to gather for worship again and do that in a way that's uh, safe and, and well understood by everyone. But welcome to worship today. Uh, the past few weeks, uh, Pastor John's been able to preach from the Gospel of Matthew, many of the parables of Jesus there, and I believe today we've got five more parables in the passage that, uh, that six more parables today in the passage that we're looking at. So just as we continue in worship here, uh, some scripture from Psalm 78 um, that was actually quoted in Matthew about parables, uh, it mentions that. But Psalm 78, 1 through 4, as we begin worship. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. Let's pray together. Lord, we are thankful to gather in your presence here at worship. May this be a time that transforms our hearts and minds uh, to be more in step with your ways, uh, that we may impact this world in a positive way. Thank you for each person that's gathered to worship you today, Lord. And give us, Lord, in this time, understanding hearts. As we listen to parables, as we listen to scripture, Grant us the liberty to worship you, Lord, in both spirit and in truth. Amen. 
our sanctuary choir sang I Must Tell Jesus. church. Today we'll have a scripture reading from 1 Kings verses, uh, chapter 3 verse 5 through 12. At Gibbon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream and God said, ask me for whatever you would like for me to give you. 
And Solomon answered, You've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. And you've continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne to this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I'm only a child who do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant here is among the people you have chosen and a great people, too numerous to count or to number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased with, this, with Solomon and asked him for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so there will never ever have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Father, this morning we, we are here gathered as a church, here in the sanctuary and across the country, Lord. We ask that you be with each of us. We ask for wisdom, and we ask for the comfort in the time of distress that we're in, for we are in strange times. Father, be with us now as we study your word and be with our pastor as he brings our message, and be with everyone who hears his voice this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much, John, for that reading. And uh, oh, that we might all have wisdom in these days, I'll tell you. It uh, seems to be in short supply. And I've thought several times about this uh, time we've spent in the, in the parables. And I've come to be convinced that this is appropriate and good time. I haven't necessarily directly addressed it to the issues of... Uh, uh, pandemic and so forth, but I think it uh, makes pretty strong application on its own that if we were living according to the kingdom of God, we would have a lot less stress and a lot more understanding about how to proceed in this wicked and crazy world in which we live right now where uh, uh, brothers and sisters are fighting one another and uh, families are falling apart and communities are in the turmoil and, uh, and distress and and uh, Frankly, the people of God are, seem to be right in the middle of the melee. And in fact, we ought to be loving and showing one another the love of God as revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And so I invite you to, to a few moments with, yes, six parables. They're brief, they're short. And at first I thought there were five, but if you get looking at it, the very last one, which to me orders the whole thing, is also set in a parabolic fashion, set as a parable. This is from Matthew chapter 13. I'm not going to read the text directly. We'll be skipping around a little bit to try to catch the text according to uh, how I felt the Spirit leading me to understand this uh, business this morning. I don't know if you'll see it or we, if we can find it, but verse 52 is a key verse, and also verse 51. Uh, Jesus had asked the disciples, do you understand all these things? And they said yes, and I don't know what his tone was when he went ahead to answer them uh, with the next verse, but there may have been a bit of a, okay, well, if you really understand, then try this on for size. And this is the sixth parable, verse 52. Jesus said, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like, and that's the kind of the key phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, that we've heard all through these texts. And now he's saying those scribes, those teachers, those students uh, that have become disciples of the kingdom, wanting to follow the kingdom of heaven, is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Jesus prompted the disciples, uh, given their level of understanding, he said, well, then bring forth some good stuff. Bring forth and, and bring it together in a way that we can understand it. God has entrusted, dear friends, to us the great treasures of the kingdom. And uh, we have those treasures, new and old, at our disposal to bring forth. And and I just pray that we'd share those treasures with the world. We'd share those treasures with one another. 
and I pray that uh, we might discover together how to share with each other. Uh, just a few more words about teaching and parables. These parables, as we are sharing our treasures old and new this week, this, these parables we have encountered have focused our attention on the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven, dear friends, is the reality in which we live right now as believers. It's not just for a time for uh, the pie in the sky by and by. It is right now. And uh, part of the kingdom is, well, the kingdom is what Jesus announced. He said it's here, it's now among us. It's not complete but it's present with us and it's something in which we should be participating as believers today. Jesus described, in, especially in this chapter, uh, these, uh, chapter 13 of Matthew's gospel, he described the kingdom in these stories and images that, that transmit great truth to those who are open to receiving it. And that's part of the mystery of the parable of teaching in parables. Some people get it, some people don't. Now, and I just want to make the dis this disclaimer for those of you who are in this know, that a religion of special knowing that would lead towards salvation is actually a heresy called Gnosticism. It's a, a long-term heresy that started uh, hundreds of years ago, if not thousands, and uh, it suggests that a secret knowledge will give you understanding that will help you be saved. Well, that's, there's nothing secretive about the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, the parables, if they underscore anything, it is in fact that the kingdom is not reserved for that special few who are the in crowd, you know, the, the believers or such as it is. The parables tell us that the kingdom of God is for everyone. And these parables this morning bear that out, I believe. The parables of the kingdom, as we have read and understood, they unveil things that are hidden since the foundation of the world. Now, that's the key for this, this quandary of understanding that we seem to have. Because for many people, those foundations, which are steeped in violence and revenge, they cloud the truth of God's goodness and his love. We just can't see past our urge and our desire to get revenge. This situation is why a person can look at the truth of God and not really see it and hear the word of the Lord but not really understand. So these six parables this week uh, tease our appetite, tease my appetite to, for a fuller understanding of the kingdom of heaven. And they fell into several types in, as I studied it, as I studied it and came to understand it. My understanding was that the first two parables are essentially about transformation. The next two parables will uh, describe the things that are of great value, surpassing, unsurpassing value. The fifth parable will pull it all together in a great fishnet, pun intended. It'll engage us, everyone. And then the last a little simile, if you please, that we read already challenges those who claim to understand to share from their treasures. So to answer the question first, how do we share these treasures with others? Let, you know, let's join Jesus in looking for God in common stories. Be aware that uh, these simple stories of, of yeast of mustard seeds, of uh, people finding treasures in fields, of, of merchants looking for the greatest best buy. Um, all these things are just common stories, and God is present and visible in them. So, verses 49 through 42, consider with me for a few moments this new and old. I want to read this again, this last parable beginning in verse uh, 49. So it will be at the end of the age... The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from in, among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a refrain throughout the chapter that uh, has so captured so many people's attention that they cannot look past it. But I tell you it's only part of the story. We continue to read and we will follow this up and understand it. Verse 51, have you understood all these things? Jesus asked and they said to him, yes. Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. The last parable anchors my thoughts, this last little simile. Uh, do they understand? Jesus said, Okay, if you understand, then I challenge you to, to bring things new and old out of your treasure, to be disciples that share of this treasure of God with the world. And think about it for a min moment with me, this question of new and old, or, or as we are more likely to say, old and new. As old as God's creation is, and as set in violence as humanity is from our foundations, 
God is constantly doing something new in our lives and in his world. God said, uh, think of it, uh, well, Isaiah 43 is one of the many places you can, you can find this emphasis. Isaiah 43, verse 19, God said, Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. This is why I've been talking so much about deliverance and about the kingdom of God being here and now. The image is immediate. It's real. God wants to transform and redeem his creation into that which he made it to begin with. That's the restoration for which we should be seeking as well. Our good God, our benevolent God, brings new blessings to his world every day. God's creative energy uh, in Ecclesiastes, Jeremiah wrote there, new every morning, his loving kindness. Each day of creation, think back, each day of creation brought forth new places to inhabit, the first three days of creation, and the second three days, the last three days, four, five, and six, the days of creation, they brought, brought forth things to dwell in, the places which had been created in the first three. It was all about creating new space and new creatures to fill the space new creations to fill the space. And every day then, since creation, the miracle of life elates us. I mean, just think about it. I have a breath I can take. And even, even this way, I can take the breath. And I'm breathing. And I'm confounded by it sometimes, this miracle of life. But it confirms for me the love of God. So what are these old and new treasures that we share? Many, many different thoughts on this. These are mine. Perhaps the new treasures involve these pictures of the kingdom that we're looking at in this chapter that will transform our lives. We've spoken of transformation already. We'll follow that up more in a moment. They capture our hearts that this transformation does. It's, and you see, because I affirm this because it is new to some people to actually think and to realize that God, for instance, from a couple weeks ago, that God, the sower, would sow words of good news with a reckless abandon and, as it were, in my mind, waste the seed, you see. It's a new thought maybe to some people that God doesn't care. He's going to share. He wants everyone to have an opportunity. It's new to some folks, who, according to the parable from last week, the wheat and the tares. It's new to some folks that we must practice patience regarding judgment. You and I may want it to happen right now. The farmer told the, told the slaves, don't you be going through that field and pulling up the weeds. weeds. You'll mess it all up. You just wait. It's in God's hands. Well, that's, that's news to some people. <laughs> that's new to some people. What are the old treasures? Perhaps the old involves the use of, of these common, everyday, ancient images of life. Perhaps also the old involves the, this end-of-age story that we just read that so captures our attention about judgment. Let's take care here. This is the one question I would use to, to rectify and to make sure that my view of judgment stays uh, on an even keel every time. Here's my question. At the end of the age, will you hope for judgment or for mercy? I want mercy through Jesus Christ. According to the scripture, there is, I will just describe it briefly. According to the scripture, there is, there will be a separation of the righteous and the wicked. And the good are gathered up in this picture. And the wicked will be placed, uh, that's uh, that word that translated throne is also placed, is set, where their choices and deeds have taken them. Punishment, I believe, results when God gives us up to our foolish ways and our wicked ways. And frankly, our own worldly wicked ways always lead to death, you see. And that's the sobering reality. All this being said, the emphasis in these parables has been and is on the new. Out of his treasures he brought new and old. See, even that's jarring in its uh, phraseology, isn't it? I, I have I always said old and new. No, Jesus said new and old. That's to emphasize the new, you see. So friends, let's do this if we're going to be faithful and able 
to share the treasures with others. We're answering how, how do we share the treasures with others? Well, expect God then, expect God to be doing something new because he is, expect it. Now, briefly, the transformative parables, verses 31 through 33. This is beautiful, two short little stories. He presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is uh, like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. As I've said, for some people, this transformative nature of the kingdom is, is a new thing. And let me, let me frame it this way. Religious communities often focus simply or exclusively or at least predominantly on the issue of salvation from hell to heaven. We expect in this mentality to have a conversion which will take place, which is like a transaction, and we're going to get to those in a moment more too in, in a moment, but a transaction wherein our faith is somehow rewarded or met by acceptance of God into his heaven. And in and, and that focus, we tend to look at almost exclusively the afterlife. These parables focus our attention rather dramatically, and I think in a, in a new fashion for some folks who have never thought about it this way, focus our attention on the transformation of our lives here and now. Think about it. The mustard seed is small, yet in this story it produces the biggest tree in the garden. It's kind of the definition of an invasive plant, Brother Ted. You know, it overwhelms the other garden plants we read. Not a few commentaries, in fact, mention the fact that to, to that world, the mustard seed or the mustard weed was considered a weed. Uh, and here it is, this farmer is actually intentionally planting this weed, if you please. And uh, certainly, it overwhelmed the other garden plants. This is a new image. So a different way of thinking about things. What it describes is a profound, a profound hospitality. Eventually, you see this tree becomes host for the birds of the air. And think about that for a moment in terms of this agricultural image. I'm not much of a gardener, but I even know that they usually put a scarecrow in the garden, right? You don't want the birds there. This guy planted, <laughs> planted this bush and it attracted the birds. This garden is transformed into an aviary, an open aviary, a preserve. And I ask you this morning, for whom is God making nests in our little garden spots and communities? For whom will we make room in our neighborhoods in the kingdom? Then think about the leaven. It transforms the flower. It's an ancient process, an old image, an old treasure, this making of bread. And, and some folks in the house have a lot of experience with making bread lately, and it's a, a magical almost uh, experience. But however, to think of the kingdom of heaven in terms of bread making, I think represented a new understanding, at least at that time. Now, we've, we've sat with these parables for 2,000 years, so it's old hat to us. Well, think about it again. Listen to it in a, in a new breath, perhaps. The image, image is emphasizing, again, the transformative nature of leaven. It has the ability to affect every grain of flour. The whole batch is affected. You see, the implication is clear in my mind. There is no chosen race or favored nation in distinction to all of humanity. The choice was and is of a people, of the people, who are chosen to this purpose, to be the leaven which affects the whole of humanity. And quite frankly, that's a new thought to some people today too, because we think it's all about us. When if this parable really is telling me anything, telling us anything, it is that that little bit of leaven is supposed to affect the whole of the world. So to transform the world, one must be first in the process of being transformed themselves. And I would say that if we're going to be faithful to share the treasures with others, be the transforming agent in the kingdom yourself. 
take, the, take on the responsibility of being leaven in this world to change it and to see it changed. Now, I want to talk about the value, the great value of uh, things, of the kingdom of God that uh, we see in verses, uh, beginning in verse 44, 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the, va- in the field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy he joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls and upon finding one pearl of great value he went and sold all he had and bought it these two parables describe the finding of things that are more valuable than all of the other things or cash that we might already have We are consumed. These guys were consumed by the value of the kingdom. They were willing to give everything they had to obtain this treasure or this pearl. In light of this kind of value, friends, doesn't the kingdom of God call for our complete attention and all of our affection to be turned towards him? This man found a treasure hidden in the field. I think that's a wonderful story. Apparently it wasn't his field. He had to buy it, right? What's he doing walking in this field? Different, different day, thinking about l- land ownership, I suppose. How did he find this treasure? Was he digging for it? I, we're not told. Did he stumble on it randomly while he was just walking through the field? He was taking a shortcut over to McDonald's or something? I don't know what was going on there, you know. But he found it, right? And Jesus, what Jesus emphasized, one of my questions, what Jesus emphasized is that the man found this treasure, recognized its value, and took action to obtain it. The man man hid the treasure, and then verse 44, the end of the verse tells us, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has. He liquidated his property, and he bought the field. The man then had enough money, you see. This is not some poor guy. He had enough resources to go buy the field. But the treasure, the value of that treasure so far outweighed all of his liquidated assets that he he couldn't wait to purchase the field. Friends, the kingdom is of such value that all other things a person might value are willingly, willingly traded in to obtain it. Jesus, uh, Paul rather in Philippians said, you know, I count all these things that I've obtained in terms of his education and whatever else he had. All these things are worthless refuse. I think King James Version says dung. Those things, they're not of value to me compared to knowing Christ and being with Christ. That is to say, walking in the kingdom. What all this suggests to me is, is that the kingdom is about something far different than our mentality of accounting, which is zero sum. Ask an accountant, that's how it's supposed to work, right? You know? Is everything should balance out perfectly to the letter, to the penny, right? Some people take that same thing that's saying that that's what religious or the faith life is about. Some kind of zero-sum accounting where um, my sins are to completely, perfectly balanced out by a sacrifice. Friends, if this story tells me anything, it is that the kingdom of God isn't about balance, it's about grace. That's a new thing for some people. Some people still don't like that idea, but that's the truth of it. The man was captivated by um, something that far outweighed and outvalued everything that he had. So he gave it all up to receive it. Now, the companion story that we read about the merchant, he's also a man of means, apparently. He's got stuff, and he knew what he was looking for. The other guy just happened upon it. Don't tell me there's not chance. He just happened to find it, you see. Uh, You can argue that further if you want to, but he just happened upon it. He found it. Then the story about the merchant, he had a list, though. He knew what he was looking for, and this ideal pearl was on his wish list, and he found this pearl. And again, he uh, he recognized that it was would would be more valuable than anything else. So he sold all he had to acquire the prize. He gave up his entire livelihood to have this one pearl. In each story, this is what I'm trying to say. This, in each story, the person realized a net gain. It wasn't zero balance. The kingdom of heaven is far more than a zero-sum accounting of sin and forgiveness, as some would have it. 
The kingdom of heaven is a grace gain for those who find it. Whether you've been looking for it or not, maybe you stumble on it. But this is the power of the gospel. Uh, One other thing to note about those two stories briefly. In neither case is the subject explicitly in competition with someone else. I know this is an argument from silence, but I think it's important. Because, for for instance, in the previous one about the wheat and the tares, we had a, a, a farmer and an enemy. There's no such conflict identified in either of these. We might imagine a scenario where it is, but it's not explicit. It's not clearly identified. What I'm trying to say is this. Though we might imagine rivals, the kingdom of heaven does not come as the reward for beating out anybody else or winning over someone else. That's not what the kingdom is about. We're not in competition for the kingdom. Grace comes from the one God who is without rival. And this God who has no rival offers us a grace that we can't fight for against others and win. It just comes from giving up all that you have to get it, according to these two stories. It's a very personal matter between them and God. Jesus said in this way, we'll be sharing the treasure with others. And it's a quote from Matthew chapter 6. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom. All other things would be added to us. Finally, and briefly in closing, the kingdom is comprehensive. We've been uh, talking about this a little bit, really already alluded to it some, but let's read verses 47 and 48. This is the fifth in the line of parables that I uh, find beautiful. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. I already addressed... uh, what I think about the judgment scene and how I understand it as a description of what's going to happen. Think about that dragnet for a moment because that's, that's the comprehensive question we really need to deal with regarding God's kingdom. Earthly kingdoms come and go. Shifts in the balance of power, while they do affect everyone, uh, especially earlier in the age, sometimes a There might be a shift in the power that nobody noticed. Kingdoms and nation states tend to demand our total allegiance. And it seems to ignore, sometimes that demand for allegiance seems to ignore the social interactions um, from kingdom to kingdom, except as opportunities for dominance. Uh, This is a distressing development of humanity is what I'm saying. It's what I believe the Word of God is saying. All kingdoms of this world are penultimate. They are but the next to last thing. The last thing, the ultimate, the final, is the kingdom of God, which Jesus has already proclaimed is among us. And now Jesus has described a fishnet that's gathering in fish of every kind. This isn't about one nation being dominant over another. This is recognizing that we're in the same net being gathered. The dragnet calls me back to this global reality of the kingdom of God. The dragnet's gathered in. There's all sorts of fish, creatures of every kind. And we're all affected by what goes on in the kingdom of heaven. This is to say all races, all cultures, all kingdoms, all countries, all times. We embrace a variety of people, friends, if we're going to be really faithful to the kingdom. We embrace a variety of people in our communities because the kingdom of heaven, there's going to be, in the kingdom of heaven, there are going to be people of every kind. Every nation, every tribe we sing from the book of Revelation. 
I, I, that's not the same thing as vacation time on the street in Bryson City when you're looking at all them foreign tags, <laughs> so to speak. But how I'm convicted by that comprehensive nature of the kingdom that all of us are God's children at some level there being affected by God's love gathered up and those who have refused to participate God will let them refuse sorrowfully sadly but that's not the emphasis you see the emphasis I believe is for us to recognize that there will be with every other per we will be with every other person in the world as part of the same in gathering now uh, put it this way we can frame this text and make it a matter of fear of judgment but fear quite frankly has failed to motivate me fully as I read it earlier and I've said already, this judgment seem it dis, it serves as a description, not a prescription. Although I know it serves for many as a warning and it should serve as a warning. But friends, what really motivates me is the hope of buying into, of purchasing, of obtaining this invaluable grace as found in the kingdom of God. That's a treasure hid in the field. That's a pearl of great price. That's a mustard tree which, which hosts the whole of creation. That's a leaven which touches every, mo every corner of this world. <clears throat> I'm more motivated by the hope of buying into the invaluable grace. I am more motivated by the prospects of sharing in the shade of a great tree with a beautiful variety of birds. I am satisfied and I'm motivated with a heavenly smell of freshly baked bread, knowing that it's the good news of the kingdom which proved it to feed us all. So if we're going to share these treasures with others, I think we're going to have to deal with the dragnet as well and recognize that we have to offer the kingdom to everyone. Because, put it this way, it's been offered to me. It's been offered to you. Bow with me for prayer. Musicians, come ahead and let's prepare to sing. Lord, help us in this day to hear and to feel and to know your presence and grace. Lord, to be responsive to your love and faithful to your word as you move through this world and change it by your grace and invite more folks into the kingdom of God in which we already move and walk and live and have our being. May Jesus Christ be praised. Amen and amen. We hope you'll join in singing. We'll start with the uh, refrain, the chorus to my tribute, and move into bless his holy name and conclude with our hymn, uh, God be the glory. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, for the things He has done, with His love He has saved.
thank you for worshiping with us. I pray that you open your heart to all that God has and is giving us through his Son, Jesus Christ. May his Spirit fill us and enable us with grace and peace. I also thank you for your continued support of the ministry of the First Baptist Church of Bryson City. You can find online giving options on our webpage at firstbaptistchurchbc.org. The office is open during the week from 8 to 12, and you can send mail uh, the old-fashioned way at Post Office Box 247, Bryson City, North Carolina, 28713. Pray for us. Serve with us. Love God. Love others. Do justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly with God. And God bless you.